Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Elon Orzi, Director of Operations for the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, as well as Michael Levitt, CEO of FSWC, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker for the event, Eddie Baum. To begin, Elon will offer some opening remarks. Elon Orzi is the Director of Operations at the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. In this capacity, he oversees the center's communications and advocacy marketing strategies. Before joining the center, Elon served as Director of Advocacy and Issues Management for Hillel Ontario, a nonprofit aimed at providing support to over 14,000 Jewish university students across nine major university campuses. Prior, Elan lived in Israel, where he served as a volunteer ambulance medic and instructor, and then served in the IDF as a sergeant in the Combat Search and Rescue Division. On returning to Canada, Elan worked for multiple members of Parliament on Parliament Hill and legislative roles. Elan, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Daniela, and thank you to Friends of Simon Wiesen Salt Center for co-hosting this important series with us. We are proud to partner with you on this and many other important initiatives in the pursuit of justice around the world. On behalf of the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. Our center's mission is inspired by Raul Wallenberg, who we commemorated this past Sunday on Raul Wallenberg Day. He was a non-Jewish Swedish diplomat stationed in Budapest during the Holocaust. He single-handedly saved that tens of thousands of Jews from one of the Nazis' most brutal killing fields. He demonstrated that one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can prevent evil and change the course of history. One of the pillars of our center's work focuses on preventing genocide, much like what we are seeing currently against the Uyghur people at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. And this is why opportunities like these to hear testimonies of survivors is timely and necessary in the prevention of further genocides. I am honored to be here to witness the testimony of Hedy Baum and on behalf of the Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, I want to thank Hedy for being here to share her story with us. Thank you to everyone and enjoy the program. Thank you so much, Ilan, for those lovely words. We appreciate your joining us this afternoon and for this important programming and for the important ongoing support and partnership with the Royal Wallenberg Center. At this point, I'm going to turn the stage over to our wonderful guest speaker, Hedy, to share her story. Hedy Baum grew up in pre-war Romania in a region that later came under Hungarian control. As the war escalated, she and her family increasingly came under influence of the Nazis. The family was deported to Auschwitz in the summer of 1940. Took about five minutes. After three months, Hedy was transferred to a work camp where she spent her time mm -hmm. as a forced labor. After liberation, she emigrated to Canada. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Hedy Baum. Hedy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I couldn't be more pleased than to be involved with something that has to do with Wallenberg. Actually, in the orphan group that I arrived to Canada with, there were uh, three of them who were saved by Wallenberg in Budapest from my little one dozen group of war orphans under 16. So nothing would please me more than to be part of this. I would like to start with showing you my favorite photograph not long before we were taken to Auschwitz. That's my best friend and me walking, walking on our main street, careless, fearless, not knowing, thinking the world is fine, that everything is well, and all is well with us. But it wasn't too long when things happened. To give you a little background of myself, this is one of the places we lived just a few years before taken away. It was looking at a courtyard. If you can see, the main building to the street was a few story high with apartments. And then the courtyard surrounded by uh, one story uh, apartment. It was very close to my school, an Orthodox Jewish all girls school that I went to, same one as my mom did, with the difference that I was an average student and she was an A plus. 
she was hoping to become a doctor, but that would never materialize in those days. Her mother was a widow. A husband died in her in his 30s, and she was in her early 30s, left with seven children. How they managed to survive without help, it would have been impossible. Fortunately, she had a sister married to a well-to-do uh, Orthodox Jewish man in a nearby small town who took care of the family for years and years. She used to drive in in her cart loaded with all sorts of produce and everything a family would need. My city was a medium-sized city and 30,000 Jews lived in a 100,000 population. We lived in peace and quiet. I was not aware of any such thing as anti-Semitism or racism. A quiet life, modest. My father was a furniture maker who had a small shop and he worked there with six, seven men making beautiful custom-made furniture to the wealthy of the city. My mother was a homemaker and I accompanied her on her daily trips in the summertime to the market to get fresh produce, fresh veggies and fruit. In those days, we didn't have all the conveniences that people have now. Um, we didn't have a refrigerator, not even an icebox. We didn't have a telephone. And I was, I think, six or seven years old before we got a radio. I remember what a big, big uh, deal it was to be able to listen to concerts from the capital city in Budapest, to see a theater performance, to hear theater performances. And uh, I was a student, as I said, an average one, my interests lay in art, gymnastics, history, literature, poetry, and I was hoping to become a gym teacher or a dance teacher. Life went on quietly, peacefully, between home, school, and the weekend visits to my cousins. That was about all life was about. Even though I went to an Orthodox Jewish school, we weren't Orthodox in the way you think of Orthodox here in Toronto or in North America. We were high holiday in the, in the temple kind of Jews. My mother had a kosher kitchen though. I have these wonderful photographs that I'm gonna show you of my parents on their wedding day and my grandmother and grandfather on their wedding day. I hope you can see it. And this is the group that I arrived to Canada with. I hope you can see. Perhaps the screen can be adjusted so that I can see what I'm showing. Anyway. To go on with my life story. As you know, in 39, 
we were taken over when the war broke up by the Hungarians. Until then, my part of the country, Transylvania, belonged to Romania. In my grandparents, great-grandparents' time, it was Hungarian, belonging to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We spoke Hungarian at home. And when I went to school, it was like a French immersion course here. Everything in Romanian. To read, to count, to study. And uh, all my classmates were more or less the same background as I was, Hungarian-speaking parents. In grade five, in addition to the Romanian language, we had to study Latin, German, and French in the school. Not optional, it was compulsory. School and life, as I said, was totally without excitement, without worry. I was a very naive child. My whole life seemed that my parents spent trying to protect me from the realities of the world. So there was no more naive 15-year-old than I was when the time came for Auschwitz and Birkenau. We heard rumors, like my parents must have, I didn't. They never discussed with me what they heard or the war, the way it was going on. For me, it was a distance, something that happened to other people. Like most people, they thought that they were citizens of Hungary, valued citizens. My father fought in the Hungarian army during World War I, was wounded, prisoner of war in Russia. And when he came back, he was very proud all his life of having served his country. And he thought himself a valued citizen. It could never, never, never happen here, they said later. Well, in 41, 2 and 3, laws came into effect. Laws that made life very difficult. From year to year, they were taking away our rights as citizens, as equals, and later on in 44, even as human beings. First, it was limitations in professions. Certain professions were not allowed. Uh, universities were not allowed for Jews. And Still, we trusted the government propaganda and we were good citizens and abided by the law. In 44, most of the mature men, Jewish men, family men were gone, recruited into so-called labor camps where they worked for and alongside the Hungarian army and some groups uh, even on the border or beyond. It was tens of thousands of them that were compelled to leave their families, wives, children, and go into these ruthless surroundings where they were treated far from, from being equals. They were not given the same clothes in the winter time as the Hungarian army got. They were not given the same food and they had to deliver the labor, the hardest, the dirtiest and the most 
dangerous. Even during air raids, they were complaining, compelled to go out and clean up. They were decimated. By the time the war was over, maybe 10% came home. So how these women managed to support and keep their children going to school to provide food, it amazes me. My father was exempt because he was in an accident in 1939 and was handicapped. So he didn't have to go to these camps. He was allowed to stay and he continued in his shop furnitures beautiful ones. I still remember the smell of the shop, the fresh wood shavings and the different polishes that they used on the fine furniture. They worked sometime anywhere from six to eight months to make an apartment full of furniture. Can you imagine what it would cost today? So life went on even with all the limitations and I never heard Hitler, Auschwitz, what happened discussed. When my parents had such discussions, I was sent out of the room, imagine. In school, we were strictly doing, studying, never discussing current effects never treated as young adults. This went on in 1944. We even had to take all our precious belongings, whatever jewelry or special paintings, sculptures we had and handed in to the police. By the time March came, 44, life was becoming very different, even for me. The principal announced in a school that this was the last day. The latest law was that there is no more schooling for Jewish children. And when I went home that day, my mother sewed the yellow star on the coat I had to wear when I went out, just like every other Jew in the city. That was the first time that I started thinking about being Jewish is being different. Is, is it being inferior? Is it something wrong with me, with us? Why wear this? ugly looking yellow star. But where I did as everyone else. But this was towards the end of the war, even though we didn't know it. Maybe the governments did and the Hungarian Nazi government that took over did everything in their power to deliver as many they are Jewish citizens to Auschwitz-Birkenau as they possibly could, as fast as they could. We were ordered to leave our homes with nothing more than a change of clothes in a little overnight bed, a blanket and a towel. We were taken to a makeshift ghetto in the middle of the town, a couple of square blocks surrounded by a tall fence. And I remember arriving to this house, taken into this apartment, and I was looking around, so many people in the apartment, and we were taken to your place, they said, which was a bedroom, but not the whole bedroom. Three corners of the bedroom were already occupied by families. That corner is yours, was pointed out. And that was that. 
Not for long, though, being 1944, and given the Nazi-Hungarian governments, we were very quickly escorted from our ghetto homes into the cattle cars, waiting not too far. Towards the end of May came our turn. I remember arriving to the cattle car and being screamed at, shoved at by the Hungarian gendarmes, my mom and dad pushing them in the cars, AD 90, as tight as possible before they handed us two pails and shut the great big doors behind us with nothing more than a small square of a window with barbed wire to get some air. 80, 90 people with a, one pail for a toilet and one pail of water. And that's how we started on our three day and three nights journey. The government propaganda was that we will be taken to the border and there we will stay until the end of the war working. The alternative was to believe the awful stories that were happening in Auschwitz, in Czechoslovakia, in Austria, and we still believed the government propaganda that we, it will not happen to us. As the trains were leaving Hungary, we started noticing strange names of towns. It was already Poland, as we found out. And when the third day was over and we stopped and the doors were opened, to the outside world after three days in the stench, in the horrible tightness of human beings who were babies crying, sick people moaning. Finally, the doors opened and we arrived. But where? I looked and as ordered because there were shouts and screams to get off, schnell, schnell, quick, quick. We were getting off the cattle cars, hundreds, thousands of people milling around, holding on to each other, mothers holding on to babies, husbands to wives. And my mom and dad got off and I jumped off the cattle car and I couldn't, I couldn't understand where am I? What is this place that I'm looking at? Unlike anything I've ever seen or heard of. As far as my eye could see left, right, besides the thousands of similar people pouring out of the cattle cars, I saw nothing but dozens and dozens of these huge barn-like buildings surrounded by tall wires, which I later found out were electrified. As far as I could see, nothing else. In front of me, there were Nazi soldiers with shiny boots holding rifles pointing rifles at us and holding back snarling dogs that were barking. Everything was bedlam beyond anything I ever seen or could imagine. And the, within a few seconds, the first order came man to the left. And my father was gone before I could even say goodbye to him. And while I was trying to figure out where am I and what is this place, orders were given, rows of five women start walking, marching. 
and I realized that my mom was already far ahead of me. And I started running as fast as I could to catch up. But after a few steps, I was stopped with a rifle in front of my chest. And a young Nazi soldier looking at me and saying, no, you go to the right. I said, no, my mom is there. I have to go there. I want to be with her. And he didn't budge. The rifle was there to the right. And I started crying and cried out after my mom, who heard me and turned around. And we looked at each other. And I don't know how long that moment lasted, a second or a minute. But it's seared in my brain, in my mind. And then she turned around and kept on going. And I never saw her again. That moment, something happened to, my, to me. I don't know. It was such a shock, such a terrible feeling of aloneness of abandonment and I joined the group of young people the Nazi soldier ordered me to go with them a little bit later we were marched in to the camp of sea lager sea camp just one of those many that I've seen it had 30 of these big barracks 15 on each side and they were big enough to house anywhere from seven to a, 700 to 1,000 women. It was built for the Hungarian women. I was taken with the group to the first, where we were told we were going to be given a shower and disinfected, ordered to get take our clothes off, shoes off, and go into the room next to us, which was a big square cement walls, floors, ceilings of a room, nothing in it. Just shower heads above us. And the water started and we had our shower. And the next thing we were ordered to go into the next room naked covering ourselves as best as we could i was horrified to see that there were strange men and women waiting for us in the next room they proceeded to shave our heads our body hair blew some disinfectant at our bodies and then we were ordered to walk by this huge long table and they threw a garment at us as we went by at random, whether you were big or small and the dress was big or small, didn't matter. That's what you got. That was yours. I got also a wooden sole clog for shoes, no panties, slips, bras, socks, nothing just the dress and the shoe and that's what i lived in all the time i was in auschwitz birkenau and later on in germany a slave labor we were ordered to go out and find a place in one of those barracks it didn't matter where as far as whatever I could, we could find a place. And as we were going, we were going in a little group, six, eight of young people like myself. By the way, I had my birthday, 16th birthday in the ghetto on, in May before we were taken. There was no birthday party, I don't have to tell you. I think life still owes me a 16th birthday party. Maybe when, I, when I'll be 96, 
I celebrate it if I make it. And here we were in Camp C, walking along, looking into these barracks that had these huge barn-like doors open. They had no windows that we could see until we came to a building that did have a window. And as the sun was shining on the window, it became like a mirror. And we all stopped and we looked. And I saw strangers in the window. I didn't recognize myself. I didn't know which one was I. I had to count one, two, three, one, two, three, to realize that that bald girl was actually me. That's Sorry. And it was a shock to see myself and not recognize me. We parted. Eventually, I found a place in one of the barracks. Some of them had bunk beds, mostly occupied, as I said, hundreds of people in every, every barrack. And I managed to find a place in almost the last of the barracks that had no beds, just a beaten floor, same as outside. I'm so sorry. I hope you can erase this part. Hetty, you're you're doing great. Just take a deep breath. We're all very much willing to hear, hoping to hear your story a little bit more. I wish I could see you. Can you put yourself on? <laughs> I can turn my camera on. Let me see. I don't see you. Okay, that's good. Hi. Good. Continue. Everyone's listening very carefully. So, I found a place, as I said, in one of these barracks that had no bunk beds. And it was a place about as big as the yoga mat. Even the floor was occupied. Hundreds of people lying on the floor. And there was this one. I am so sorry. I don't know how to shut it off. price we all pay from working from home we definitely Just all take the to... phone tell her to take the phone off the hook that's all i took the phone off the hook and it kept on ringing really oh, yes i am terribly sorry keep going Hattie. you're good not to worry so i found this place and i made it mine The floor, same, no floor, just the beaten earth. And I want to tell you my impression of, of the whole place was everything gray and everything earth tones, beige, brown, no color. I remember Auschwitz's drab beyond words. There wasn't a blade of grass. Not one bush, not one flower, not one tree anywhere to be seen. Just the gray wood barracks and the brown beaten earth. My great fortune was that I made up my mind when I entered the camp that my mother must be going into a similar camp, same as I did. And being young and strong and intelligent, she will survive. So me alone for the first time in my life, I had to watch and take care of myself, make sure to do everything that will make it possible for us to meet again after the war when everything will be over. And that was my mindset. And in that order, to stay healthy, to stay 
alive to live that day. I started going out to before our so-called sale appell, the row calls, I went out to our washrooms where there were big sinks with taps, cold water running. And early morning, while it was still dark, I would take my dress shoes off, everything, and wash myself from head to toe in the cold water, dry myself with my hands, put back the dress, and get back to my barrack in time for the roll calls. Twice a day we had to stand anywhere from three to four hours, standing at attention, rows of five, not moving, not talking. I'd like you to go home, turn off TV, radio, television, and just stand still for 15 minutes and see what it's like. If we moved or talked, the guards came around and they had whips. They used it. At the end of the first roll call on my first morning, I don't have to tell you how hungry I felt. Three days in that cattle car, I don't think I had very much food there or drinks. I could hardly wait for the so-called soup to arrive. They brought it in a huge barrel, put it on the end of the row, and started labeling it into bowls and cups. And every row had one bowl or one large cup that we were supposed to drink from and pass it on back and forth until it was gone. And I was watching, watching the girl who got it first take a sip. And then, to my amazement, she burst out crying and handed over the cup to the next person. I couldn't, couldn't imagine what was wrong with her. And then I took a sip from the so-called soup and I understood that was no soup. It was no meat, no potatoes, no carrots, no veggies, nothing like that in it. In that, that was a brown, dirty looking liquid with little twigs in it, and it left the residue of sand, little pebbles sometimes in it, and it tasted awful. And then again, the voice in my head said, but if this is all you get, you need the nourishment, however little there is in it, so drink it. And I drank it. I held my nose, I cried, and I swallowed and swallowed every day as much as they gave me. That awful stuff. One day, it rained. And my spot had a hole right above on the roof. And there was a big puddle when I wanted to sit down in it in the afternoon. And I knew if I sit in that cold, wet puddle, I'm going to get sick. If anyone got sick in Auschwitz-Birkenau, that was it. That was the end. If you got weak, diarrhea, dysentery, they took you away. So I thought I'll have to figure something out. There was no other place for me to go to. I went outside and we were allowed between roll calls to walk around the uh, barracks. And I found three little pieces of wood, about an inch thick, about two, three inches wide, left from the construction of the barracks. And I took those three pieces of wood back with me and when I had to lie down in the evening, I put one under my bent knees, one under my hips, and one under my shoulder. And it raised me about a quarter of an inch above the puddle. And that's how I slept. I was alone. 
day after day, week after week. I went out and looked for friends or relatives, and I found two aunties with their daughters in one of the barracks. I tried and did join one to stay with them, but somehow I felt more alone when I was with them than when I was on my own. So I went back to being alone. I met a couple of school mates, one of them, a favorite one, I'll never forget. My best friend, Hedy, who I shown you the photograph, I also met. And she told me that she can't swallow the soup. She can't, she can't, it's not possible. She was already sick. She lived on that little piece of bread and margarine that we got every day alongside the soups. And of course, it wasn't enough, not only not to be hungry, but as far as nourishment went. We were hungry, morning, noon, at night. It became a way of life. There was nothing to do about it. One day in August, I went to visit my second auntie. And before we had a chance to even have a visit, a new order came for roll calls. And a, a special roll call, we were told not to go anywhere. If we're not in our barracks, stand for roll call wherever we are, immediately. So I stood there with my auntie and her two daughters. And it was that day that the selection took me and them. Before that, daily those selections were done during roll calls, but I was never picked and could never figure out to hope for or to be afraid to be picked for one of those groups. So this time it was a thousand of us that were picked and marched out from the, uh, from the camp. Disinfection, shower, a piece of bread. And then instead of being taken to the cattle cars to be taken to our new destination, which we found out later was Fallersleben, a German ammunition factory, we were taken back towards our camp, but not in it. Right across was another camp, empty, and we were ordered into one of those empty barracks, told to leave our dress and shoes outside, not to take it in it with us. And naked, we were ordered and locked in that barrack for the whole night until next day. At some point, they opened the doors and we went through the whole thing again. The shower, the disinfection, address. This time we were taken to the cars, the cattle cars. And eventually, I don't know if it took a day or two, how long, I can't remember. We arrived in Germany, Fallersleben, which is now called Wolfsburg. And I was there again in 2016 and 17 when I went for the Nazi trials with my daughter. And it looks nothing like in those days when I was there. I didn't recognize anything, not even the factory. The factory is there now, totally, totally motorized, everything done by robots, practically, and machines, no people. So we found out that the Allies were bombing the factories and the city. And they bombed down the whole one side of the street, not where the factory was, but across the street where our dormitory was in the basement. And had they managed to ruin 
the dormitory in the basement, we would have been taken to the crematorium and disposed of. But fortunately, even though the building two or three story high was in ruins, the basement was intact and there was room for 500 of us to be housed for the rest of the time. And fortunate again, how lucky we were that in this place, in this dormitory, it wasn't built for Jews. It was built for guest workers. So it was quite, quite decent. It had tiled floors, it had bunk beds, two huge rooms filled with rows and rows of single bunk beds. And there was a huge room with shower, showers and hot water. Can you imagine? And the beds had blankets. So compared to Auschwitz, we arrived to Hilton Hotel. I shared the bunk bed with my cousin, Kati, and her mom and her youngest sister, the lower bunk bed. Above us, even the ceiling was in ruins and huge, huge uh, construction cables could be seen. I, we all watched big, big rats walking by on the cables, not too far above our heads. We were ordered next day into the factory. But that night we received a soup, our first taste of Fallersleben and life there. And it was very different, thank God, to what was in Auschwitz-Birkenau. The soup had everything a soup should have in it. Potatoes, carrots, even a little piece of meat in the first few weeks so that we were strong enough, able to do the 12 hour shifts in a factory that we had to do, sometimes during the day, sometimes during the night. 12 hours, six days a week, we were ordered across the street into the factory and allowed to work at assembly line tables or taught how to do some of the machine, how to work on some of the machines. To start with, I was on the assembly line table, but I had this foolish notion and I wanted to slow down the assembly line table. But of course, when the work piled up in front of me, I was found out and in punishment, I was taken to this huge big press machine that was very close to the great big door that ordinarily bigger than a garage door opened up to let the trucks come in, trucks with uh, metals and chemicals that the factory needed. The Wehrmacht soldier stood there in his winter uniform with winter jackets, winter coats, hats, gloves, boots. And I was a couple of meters away from him in my little cotton dress that I got in Auschwitz in June. Eventually they forgave me and I was allowed again back to a different assembly line table. I'd like to try and tell you to imagine being totally without any news of what's happening in the world for any length of time. You who are used to computers, iPhones, iPads, being in contact with each other constantly, imagine that the moment, from the moment we left our hometown 
end of May. There was no news that we were given about what was happening in the world. We didn't know if the war was going well for the Allies or for the Nazis. And we didn't know if and when we managed to survive and live, to be liberated, if it will be to be ongoing slaves in a Nazi Germany, in the Nazi world, or if the Allies win, we will be reunited with our loved ones. All these months I lived in Auschwitz, I was still clinging to my imagined fate my mother had and of being reunited. Whatever happened to me, I imagined was happening to her. And I thought if I live through it, she can. And I still, even in Fallersleben, months and months, into the winter, I still didn't know any better and I was still dreaming of the time of the day we would be liberated and I would be able to rejoin my mom. I had no hope that my father would survive. Being handicapped, I knew that he had no hope of survival in the circumstances that we were in. He was of no use if he couldn't put in a hard day's physical work. But I was convinced my mother was and that we will be together. Life in the Palersleben factory was long and difficult and monotonous, but you could live through it, you could manage it. We were a fortunate group that was able to survive practically everyone. With the food, it, was enough, it gave us enough strength to do the work and the work was indoors, unlike so many people who had the misfortune to work in summer clothes outdoors in the winter and cold. Back from the factory, from the work, no matter if for 12 hours I didn't eat or the others, we rushed into the hot showers to revitalize us, to clean ourselves from the factory dirt. And then we went and got our portion of food for the day. But even our bread was bigger in the beginning than it was in Auschwitz-Birkenau. So we survived months by months. I living on hope, not knowing the reality. I don't know. I think it was the greatest blessing, this whatever happened to my mind and being that made me able to hope and shut everything out that would have been negative. Months and months went by, air raids constantly. During the time we worked, we had to keep on working. During our sleep time, we were awakened and marched into the shelters in the basement. We spent many, many hours there waiting for the all clear. And one of the happiest moments there for me was seeing the fear in our Nazi guards eyes when we were rushing towards the uh, basement shelters. The mighty Nazi guards, they were scared to death from the Allied bombers. I don't think we were, I know I wasn't. It was too, too wonderful to be aware that they could be human too, and they could be afraid. 
we entertained each other. Whoever had some gift to dance or to sing or to recite poetry, we did that for hours on end. In the factories, one day in 1945, about six, seven months in Germany already, still haven't heard one word about what's going on beyond the walls of the factory. The young French political prisoner across the table from my where I was working, also assembly line work. And of course, being a young man in French, uh, we were told we can't even look at each other. We certainly can't talk to each other. And the guards were coming back and forth constantly, making sure it was so. Anyway, he found after some time a moment where he motioned to me to look and he threw a little folded piece of paper next to my foot. I picked it up when the guard was looking elsewhere and I hid it in my boots, shoes. And when we got back to our dormitory, I read it and then read it to everyone there. It was the first news And it said, the Allies are advancing. Don't give up hope. It won't be long now. That was around February 45, to my best recollection. And we were liberated in mid-April on the 14th. But this piece of news I wonder if anyone can imagine what it means to us. Maybe if you imagined you won a hundred million dollars on the lotto, or your son or daughter became a Nobel Prize winner, maybe that comes close to what it meant to us, this news. Of course, we all shared the news and we all rejoiced that this is happening and it's hope. We can hope now, legitimate hope. We have a right to hope. Light when life went on, the portions became smaller, the soup a little bit thinner by February, March. And in April, they ordered us into cattle cars again. Apparently, as we found out later, the Allies were advancing from the West and they didn't want us liberated. They were trying to hang on to us and the cattle cars moved towards the East. But the Russians were advancing from the East. There was nowhere to go and they dropped us off in Germany in another camp much smaller, but similar to Birkenau. The barrack was the same, the beaten earth was the same. And we again was lying on the ground, didn't have to work. There was no factory, but there was also no food. We were not given any bread, any soup. I don't know how many days went by one day we were allowed to walk around there was a big big barrack with open doors and we saw trucks with produce going in there i was walking on the, just to get some fresh air with my auntie and two cousins and we were watching as they unloaded carrots and vegetables in that barrack we didn't eat for four or five days by then, nothing. At what we were beyond hunger, not even hungry anymore. But my auntie thought it would be a good idea if when the guard turned the corner as he was patrolling the barrack, 
if I ran in and grabbed a couple of bunches of carrots and came back so we have something to eat. So I did that and risked my life for two bunches of carrots and I was successful. I got back before he turned the corner and could see me and we feasted on the carrots for the first time we ate something and then again nothing. As I said, we were beyond hunger. On April 14th, I'll never forget it, how I was sitting with my back against the barrack. It was sunshine. A day was full of sun and it was comforting, the warmth and the light. And I was sitting there with my cousin and a couple of people ran by and looked at us sitting there and said, come on. We're liberated, don't you know? <laughs> I looked at my cousin, she looked at me and we said, yeah, sure, sure. And we kept on sitting there, enjoying the warmth of the sun, until a few other people ran by and again they said, don't you know we're liberated, the Nazis are gone? Hearing it for the second time, we figured it's worth investigating. So we did. We got up and we went to the gates where the guard usually stood with the rifle, machine gun. It was open and the place was filled with slaves like us, our group as well, and jeeps with American soldiers throwing guns and uh, candy at us and telling us we are free, free. People who knew it earlier were coming back already. They found food coming back with handfuls of bread and jam and butter and ro uh, rolls of salami and uh, American soldiers were warning us, please be very careful what you eat. Your system is not used to normal food anymore. Eat very little, very carefully. So we did. And fortunately, we didn't get sick, unlike hundreds of other people who gorged themselves on the salamis and jams and butters and breads that they had. And there was diary and dysentery. You couldn't believe after the first day, you couldn't get into the washroom. It was overflowing. The barracks, unimaginable. People lost control. They couldn't help themselves. And one of the most wonderful things, the Americans asked for volunteers to help clean up that terrible, terrible mess that the sick people did. And Yugoslav young men who were also prisoners volunteered and cleaned up the terrible latrines and barracks and made it possible to use again. Yugoslav non-Jewish man. I love Yugoslavs ever since. It was the day of liberation, the happiest day that should have been in my life. But my cousin sat me down and told me the truth about Auschwitz-Birkenau, the road my mother was on, the same road with all the young mothers and babies and small children and grandmothers, that it was going straight to the poison gas chambers. And that's when I learned that I'm an orphan. Eventually, we were taken near Bergen-Belsen and the Americans put us into apartments still six or eight to a room, but 
it was a room and it had normal beds and decent floors and walls. It was the first time after a long time that we were treated as human beings as equals. I was there for about three months and the uh, Red Cross had long lists of survivors that we uh, were put on and read daily the news about the new uh, lists that they put out. And of course, I knew that there is nothing for me to look except maybe some cousins or aunties, but there were very few of those two. Because of my auntie had her young husband in a work labor camp, she insisted that we have to go home. She can't go anywhere else in the world until she knows whether he's alive or not, hoping that he was a young man in his 30s. So we applied to the Americans who had a lottery and every week sent a new group of people back to their countries, in our case, Hungary. And it took us two weeks from Fallersleben, Germany to get to our home. When we arrived, I ran to my mother's sister, youngest sister. She is the one who had these photos that are so precious to me and who had my mom's ring and necklace. She and her husband were still there, fortunately, because she married a non-Jew Hungarian and was exempted, was saved from my mother's fate. And when we went in a ghetto, we took our photos and our precious few little pieces of jewelry my mom had to her, and it was there for me when we arrived. I got back in three months after liberation, I think, sometimes in August, 1945. And they were so good to me. I made my home with them. They were my parents instead of my parents. But the weight of what happened to me was there within me, even though I tried to bury it, to press it down. I only spoke once to my auntie and uncle about what happened that first night when I joined them and never again. Even others, when my classmates came back, when a friend of mine came back, we didn't speak about it to anyone. And most people weren't interested anyway. Not, not, they didn't ask questions. We all pretended it never happened. And I learned English for those two years I spent there after the war to read and write. I learned gymnastics, took dancing classes, and apprenticed to a photographer to become, to learn the profession. In those days, that's how it was done. I regret to this day I didn't go back to school. Grade 10 was the last for me as far as school education was concerned. Here in Toronto, later on, I had a chance to have lectures and evening uh, classes, and I took advantage of them, and I was an avid reader all the time. And I learned English by buying comic books when I got to Toronto. The first thing I splurged on from my salary once I was working in a, a garment trade factory, and believe me, it was hard, dirty work that I hated from the bottom of my heart, but 
I bought one or two comic books every week, and I read them, enjoyed them. I wish I had now the collection. They probably would be worth a fortune. Superman and all the heroes, Archie, the teenagers, and their escapades. It was my way of learning the North American life. We were not part of it. We were always strangers. But I'm, I'm running ahead. I'm jumping too far ahead. So after two years in my hometown, I decided in a very short time to get married to my husband. I have the photo here. And he, after coming back, fortunately, from labor camp, decided that he will not want to live under the communist regime. He saw it as a dictatorship, and he wanted to be free. A lot of people didn't see communism coming as they didn't want to believe the Nazis were coming. He learned his lesson, and he saw that we were already very close to the Iron Curtain, and it won't be very long before it will shut us in. So practically the last minute, December 47, in the middle of the winter, he arranged for a farmer to guide us to the Hungarian, to, to Hungary through the border from Romania. We married at noon, and left in the evening with a suitcase each. Of course, by then, the regime didn't give passports. We had no passport, no visa, no money. But we went in hope of finding a home and freedom to live our life as we could possibly as well as we can. It took three months to get our visas, spent it in Budapest in a maid's room of my husband's cousin. And for the first time, I had fleas in, and, and uh, bugs in my hair. Not even in Auschwitz did I get it, except from the maid's room in Budapest. Eventually, I again, which went across the border illegally to Bratislava, where my mother's two siblings survived. My auntie Margit, and she has a story. She was such a brave, bright woman. And an uncle, Josef, whose daughter, Katica, is still there in Bratislava, my cousin, and we talk on Facebook very often, which is wonderful. She is the only relative I have left, other than a niece in Israel, a grandniece. So here we were in Czechoslovakia, finally, through the help of a Jewish agency getting a temporary passport, just good enough to leave the country, and a visa for Canada. The Jewish uh, agency managed to put us into this under-16 orphan group from Hungary, Budapest. And although they were already in England, they put us on a plane, and we joined them three days before the Aquitania, this beautiful big ship departed from Southampton. We arrived in 1948, August, to Halifax. We were put on a train, immediately sent to Toronto, to a safe house on Bathurst and Harvard, where we, the Jewish agency, kept us for a month giving us English lessons in the mornings. 
we were, I don't know, six, eight, ten to a room in an old mansion and very happy to be here, to finally be in Canada. We were uh, visited by phone by someone who was looking for relatives, at an old Jewish gentleman. And he found out that he's a distant relative to my husband. So we met and eventually we moved into their home, rented the three third floor rooms that he had in his home on Howland Avenue, just north of Blue Batters. And it was a little bit better than being with total strangers. We went to work immediately, unlike the young people who were sent to homes and schools and were given opportunities to learn a trade. We decided we can support ourselves and we left, took the first job we could, my husband in a knitting factory and me in this garment factory. And as I said, it, even though it was something that I hated to do, it was necessary because it covered the rent. It was quite high. In those days, there were no apartments as there are today. And we lived, people rented part of their homes, flats, and we were glad to have these two furnished rooms to start with. Our family became the little group of orphan children. And eventually when we had our own flat, when I had my kitchen, which I had to share with four other people and the bathroom to share with everyone, even the owners of the home, there was a, a fridge and a stove and I was working while they were going to school. There was money to buy bananas and dates and oranges, things that were unheard of in Hungary where we were coming from. So it became a sort of social club in the beginning. Uh, the world was not ready for us. They didn't know about trauma, counseling, and most people weren't really interested in knowing about what happened to us, and we were not eager to discuss it either. I learned not to because when I did, I would break down and cry uncontrollably at some point and realized that I had to go on ignoring, worrying, not thinking, not talking about it if I wanted to survive. And most of us did that. Even though the Jewish Congress arranged some social workers for the young people, and even I and my husband were given the opportunity to speak with them, it was so obvious that they had no inkling how to treat us. It, they, they had the superior attitude toward the poor, ignorant immigrants. With, I felt so humiliated. I, I left in tears a couple of times and then decided never to go back. And this is the way we managed the best we could with what we had. I consider myself very lucky to have found citizenship here and life here. And I taught my children to be aware of how fortunate they are and that this is the greatest gift I gave them to be born a Canadian citizen. And when I speak to students, which I started doing about a dozen or so years ago, I emphasize that the most important part 
realize how fortunate you are. Realize how much you have to, be, have, to, to have to be grateful for. You have a home, you have parents, you have schools, you have wonderful teachers. All these opportunities, please don't take it for granted. Be grateful for it. Tell them, tell them you love them, tell them you appreciate them. And never ever do what I did. Quietly go where they tell you, think for yourself, trust yourself and rock the boat. I teach the opposite, I was taught. I was taught to speak when spoken to and to be quiet and do as I'm told. Now I tell the students, think for yourself, act for yourself, trust yourself, you're important. The most important person, it's you. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you're dumb or you can't do what you want to. You can and you will trust yourself. And be one of those who make a difference. And you are young and bright with all the opportunities. You will have a chance. I believe that you will make a better world than we leave you with. Wow, Hetty, I, I have no words. I'm, I'm absolutely, I think I speak on behalf of every single person on the call today. Thank you from the bottom of all of our hearts for sharing your story today. I thank you for everything that you've shared, all of your wisdom, all of, I know it can't have been easy to go through all of that. We wanna thank you so much for again, coming on and sharing your story today. I know everyone was listening incredibly, incredibly well. And again, you are an absolute, you know, we can't thank you enough for everything, really, truly. I am sorry if I didn't leave uh, time for questions, but if there are questions sent to you, you can forward it to me and I will be very happy to answer. Absolutely, we absolutely. Or if you know the person, even give them my email. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hetty, for everything and for all of you for coming on. I want to throw it back to our president and CEO, Michael Levitt, just for a couple of seconds to give some closing remarks. And again, Hetty, thank you so much. Michael. Hetty, thank, thank you so much. Uh, to Daniela's point that, that, that there's no words, I'll tell you, the word that comes to mind listening to you is courage. Courage then for what you face. That moment when you stood there and you and your mom looked at each other, um, most of us would have just crumpled. And the fact that you were able to continue and survive and just find ways of getting through um, is absolutely beyond inspiring. But courage, not just then, Eddie. Courage now. Courage now that you can be um, here doing this important, such an important um, mission of providing testimony and inspiring and not just for those of us on uh, this Zoom this afternoon. Uh, and, and I noticed that we've got other survivors that are, that are joining us, Pinchas and Eva and Claire and Nate and Andy are all here sharing uh, uh, your story with you. Um, but that this is going to be used in classrooms across the country at a time when more than ever, more than ever, um, the importance of your and the other sur survivors' stories is absolutely critical. At a time when two weeks ago, um, we saw uh, uh, elements of, of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial and distortion like a Camp Auschwitz hoodie on display. When last week we saw a synagogue in Montreal um, painted with a swastika on the door and it could have been far worse. These are the reasons that it is so important that we continue to have you and the other survivors speaking out, inspiring us, and inspiring students um, as to why what you went through must never, ever happen again. So I just want to thank you. Um, I want to thank our partners uh, at the Wallenberg, Ilan, who was on earlier, and I know Erwin um, was, on, uh, was on and maybe still is. Thank you um, to them, uh, to the staff at Wiesenthal, Daniela and Jordan and Elena and Melissa and everybody that makes it uh, um, possible for us to do these. And last but not least,
to all of you and I recognize and see so many of the faces that come on um, for every one of these sessions because you know and you understand um, the importance and the courage of Hedy and the survivors that come and share their stories with us in this and so many other forums. So thank you to all of you for um, giving us the opportunity to uh, bring this to you every two weeks. And just as a last thing, I wanna mention, uh, it's International Holocaust Remembrance Day, next Wednesday, a week today, J uh, January 27th. And we have a, a full um, day of events, but we have especially a, a program in the evening at 6 p.m. You can get the information on our, on our website and uh, it's in our emails that we send out. And uh, there's going to be both a ceremony with survivors from across the country, as well as um, a presentation and a lecture uh, that will follow it as well. So with that, I, I know we've gone over time, but Hetty, just once again, thank you for your courage. Thank you for sharing your story. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us today as well. Have a good night, everybody.